interrogation that's uh, uh, posted online. Uh, uh, in other words, our law should make uh, it easier within the law, not harder, to gather intelligence to keep Americans safe. And yet it seems that the current policy actually runs counter to that basic principle. Does my friend from New Hampshire agree? I, I do. I do agree because it, I mean, as a matter of common sense, this amendment uh, should go forward because the reality is that to tell our enemies online what to expect uh, is, just defies common sense. And that's really what we're doing with this amendment. Please. I find the discussion fascinating. Uh, uh, if I may enter into the colloquy. Is that, is that okay? Object, subject to the previous order, the senator is welcome to join the colloquy. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As I understand it, the reason you're having to do this is because the President Obama, by executive order, prevented the CIA and other agencies from using any enhanced interrogation techniques that have been classified in the past. Is that correct? That, that's right, Senator Graham. And uh, unfortunately, we're just telegraphing to our enemies okay. the techniques Let's, we're going to use. If I may ask another question. So all of us agree that we don't want to torture anybody. Waterboarding is not the way to gather good intelligence. It's not only is it not the right thing to do, it's just not the wise thing to do. But we believe that we've gone too far the other way. That when the president said that no interrogation technique is available to our intelligence community other than the Army field manual, do you agree for the first time in American history we're advertising to our enemies what we can do to you if we capture you and no more can be done. I would say, Senator Graham, that's absolutely right. That's why uh, I appreciate that you've sponsored this amendment, uh, that Senator Lieberman, I, I appreciate his leadership. And I have to say, uh, while we're in this colloquy, Senator Lieberman's also been a mentor uh, to me in the Senate, and I appreciate that with his leadership on these issues. But it really comes down to that, uh, to not telegraphing, not advertising to our enemies uh, what techniques are professionals, and this amendment is limited to uh, the group of professionals that is going to focus on these issues the, that will be gathering t intelligence from terrorists. Uh, and we've got to protect our country. So why we would do this, it just doesn't make sense. To my good friend from Connecticut, there's a proposal pending on the floor of the United States Senate that would say for the first time in American history that if a United States citizen decides to collaborate with the enemy, they cannot be held as an enemy combatant. I think you're very familiar with the history of the law in this area. Unfortunately, during the entire history of the country and other conflicts, American citizens have on occasion collaborated with the enemy. One of the most famous cases being the N. Ray Curran case, where you had American citizens in New York and other places helping Nazi saboteurs uh, try to sabotage America. And in that case, the Supreme Court ruled that an American citizen could be detained as an enemy combatant because the decision to collaborate with the enemy is a decision to go to war with your country, not a common crime, and the law to be applied is that of the law of war. Now, I'm sure the senator is familiar with the Hamdi case, where an American citizen seized over Afghanistan, in Afghanistan was allowed to be held as an enemy combatant, and the Hamdi decision reaffirmed N. Ray Curran, and the Padilla case involves an American citizen captured in the United States accused of collaborating with al-Qaeda. All of those cases reaffirm that the law of the land is that if you choose to help al-Qaeda, you've committed an act of war against your fellow citizens and you can be held as an enemy combatant for an indeterminate period of time so we can gather intelligence about what you may have done or about what you know about the enemy. Do you agree that now would be a very bad time for the United States Congress to say for the first time in American history that if an American citizen decides to help al-Qaeda attack us kill us, 
our military can't hold them as an enemy combatant and find out what they were up to? Uh, Mr. President, I, I thank uh, my, my friend from uh, South Carolina, and of course I, I totally agree with you, not, not only first of course on the principle, as you've said very well, and you know the law as well or better than anybody around here, um, the, uh, the Supreme Court has made clear that uh, an American citizen who, who by his or her acts has declared themselves to be an enemy of the United States can be treated as an enemy combatant. If we change that now, it's wrong on principle, but it is absolutely the wrong time to do this. And I will speak now for a moment, uh, a privilege to be the chair of the Senate Homeland Security Committee. Um, the 10 minutes allocated for the colloquy have expired. I wonder if I might ask unanimous consent for additional four minutes. Without objection. Uh, very briefly, the great concern that we have now in terms of the security of the homeland uh, is from so-called uh, homegrown terrorists, radicalized Americans uh, who effectively have joined al-Qaeda or other terrorist enemies uh, to, uh, to attack the United States. It is a, uh, a sad and painful reality that since 9-11, the only Americans killed on American soil by Islamist extremists and terrorists have been killed by other Americans who've been radicalized, who have become enemy combatants. Uh, and uh, I'm speaking particularly of, of the field, the marshal, uh, excuse me, the major uh, uh, Hassan, Nidal Hassan, who killed 13 uh, people at Fort Hood, and then uh, an American named Bledsoe, uh, who walked into an Army recruiting station in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and killed an Army recruiter just because he was wearing the uniform of the U.S. Army. So uh, these people, in my opinion, have, have uh, taken sides. They've joined the enemy. And uh, to have this body at this time, as the threat of homegrown terrorism rises, say no, they can't be treated as enemy combatants, uh, is not, not only doesn't make sense, and, and is uh, uh, totally uh, um, uh, unresponsive to the facts that I've just described, uh, the fact is that uh, it's also dangerous. Uh, so I uh, couldn't agree with the Senator more. I, I want to thank Senator Ayotte as we come to the end of this colloquy uh, for, for your initiative here, frankly for swiftly establishing yourself in the Senate as one of, one of our important leaders on national security matters. I know your experience, well, I'm a little biased about this, but I know your experience as a former State Attorney General has helped as well as uh, what I've noted uh, uh, is your active and uh, informed participation on the, on the Armed Services Committee. So I, I must say that as I uh, am about to enter my last year privilege to be a United States Senator, uh, it gives me great comfort to know that you're going to be uh, here, Senator Ayotte, to carry on these fights for uh, American national security and for freedom. Th thank you so much, uh, Senator Lieberman. Again, I appreciate your leadership, all you've done for our country to protect our country. Uh, I, I dare say that uh, you, no one's been more focused on protecting our country in this body, and we deeply appreciate your leadership. Uh, before I yield the floor, I need to briefly discuss uh, the withdrawal of an amendment that I have, uh, which is 1067 regarding notification of Congress with respect to the initial custody and further disposition of members of al-Qaeda and affiliated entities. Uh, I have received assurances from the Armed Services Committee, majority and minority staff, that these common sense steps that are outlined in that amendment will be addressed when the defense bill goes to conference. Therefore, Mr. President, I also ask unanimous consent that my amendment be withdrawn. Uh, that's Amendment 1067, and uh, that's an amendment that I would ask that be withdrawn, but I also understand that the Armed Services Committee uh, we'll take up my amendment when the defense bill goes to conference as part of the conference on this bill. Without objection, the amendment is withdrawn and the Senate will now proceed to a period of morning business for the duration of one hour. Mr. President. Uh, Senator from Connecticut. I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.
President. I'd ask unanimous consent to terminate the quorum call. Without objection. Uh, I'd like to be uh, to be able to speak in morning business. For can you let me know when 10 minutes is up? The Senate is in morning business, and I will let you know when 10 minutes is up. Uh, to my and, and to do a colloquy with my good friend from um, um, Connecticut. You said something, uh, Senator Lieberman, that I think we need to sort of absorb. As the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, do you believe that the likelihood of American citizens being recruited and enlisted and radicalized on behalf of al-Qaeda is going up? Is that what you're trying to tell us? Uh, Mr. President, I say to my friend from South Carolina, uh, I not only believe it, it, it's shown by the facts. I, I wish I had them, the numbers exactly in front of me, but if, if you chart uh, attempts at terrorist attacks on the U.S., and here I'm limiting to people who are affiliated with the global Islamist extremist uh, movement, um, there were a few after 9-11, but in the last two or three years, the numbers have gone up dramatically. Now, I want to say, um, hasten to say, that uh, these represent a very, very small percentage of the Muslim American community. But, of course, it doesn't take too many people to cause great havoc. We have been, we have been effective at law enforcement, and frankly, we've been lucky that uh, all but two of these attempts have been stopped. But I think you'd find law enforcement officials, Homeland Security officials, saying that the toughest, the, the, the most dangerous threat right now to the homeland security of the American people comes from homegrown terrorists who have been self-radicalized or radicalized by somebody else. Well, I think that's important for us to understand. Do you agree with me that when you look at the war on terror, that the United States is part of the battlefield? Well, there's no question that our enemies uh, have declared it part of the battlefield. The very uh, commencement, official commencement of the war against Islamist terrorism, 9-11, was an attack on America's homeland, on, on civilians. On so, so let's just go with that thought for a moment. Let's say that our intelligence community, our law enforcement community, and our military Department of Defense, they're all monitoring al-Qaeda threats at home and abroad. Do you agree with that? Absolutely true. Al-Qaeda and uh, like uh, other uh, Islamist uh, terrorist groups. Now, under the Posse Comitatus Act, the military cannot be used for domestic law enforcement functions. Do you agree with me that tracking al-Qaeda operatives, citizens or not, within the United States, is not a law enforcement function, it's a military function. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really a combination. Right, but our military has the ability to uh -huh. defend us against al-Qaeda attacks at home, just like they do it abroad. Right. The, so if the Department of Defense somehow intercepted information about an al-Qaeda cell, let's say in Connecticut or South Carolina, could they be involved in suppressing that cell? Yeah, I, I would say that um, what's, what's happened here since 9-11 and what we needed to have happen is that the old stovepipes have dissolved. And uh, we've got uh, military, civilian, CIA, FBI, each with a, with a focus, um, working uh, together. Very, very often, um, for instance, uh, the, the, the doctor, the Army doctor who killed 13 people at Fort Hood, um, our committee did an investigation of that case. He was actually communicating with the radical cleric Alaki in, um, in Yemen over the Internet. Uh, that was picked up by, by uh, international uh, intelligence operatives, and uh, the part of the story is it wasn't transferred effectively to the Army to, so they could grab him before... Um, uh, before he, he committed that mass murder at Fort Hood. But I, I have to say for the record that the primary responsibility uh, for counterterrorism now in the U.S. is with the FBI that's developed an extraordinary uh, capability since 9-11. Right. Uh, but uh, it it's worked very closely with, with um, CIA gathering international intelligence, NSA, 
uh, Homeland Security and, and the military. Okay, it's a team. It's a team effort. Right. Now let's imagine a scenario next week where we find an Al Qaeda cell exists that's planning a series of attacks against the United States, and within that cell you have some American citizens, and you have people that have come here, uh, non-citizens. Would you agree with me, since Congress has designated cooperating or collaborating with Al Qaeda to be a, a act of war, that that entire cell could be held as enemy combatants and questioned by our intelligence community as to what they know about the attack in question or future attacks? Well, I, that certainly should be the case be, because they've all, and this, we've had this circumstance in reality, they're all part of the same uh, enemy, and in the, in the case you uh, posit, uh, they've all been part of the same plot to attack the American people. So would you agree with me that the current law is very clear that any time an American citizen joins the enemy force, uh, they can be held as an enemy combatant? That is the law. That's the law, and as you've said, and, and Chairman Levin has said several times in the debate, uh, there may be some in the chamber who don't like it, but that's what the United States Supreme Court has said very clearly. Now, if, if we capture an American citizen as part of this cell, and you can't hold them as an enemy combatant for intelligence gathering purposes, does domestic criminal law allow you to hold someone for an indefinite period of time to gather military intelligence? No. Does domestic criminal law focus on the wrongdoing of the actor based on a specific event and you're trying to resolve a dispute between the wrongdoer and the victim? Yes, it does, and there, you're making a very important point here. It goes back to the colloquy that Senator from New Hampshire and I had which is that when you, when you capture uh, an enemy combatant, you do so for two reasons, main reasons. One is to get that enemy off the battlefield. The second uh, is to gather intelligence. And sometimes the second purpose is more important than the first because it can lead you to other plots against uh, the American and, people. And do you agree with me that the reason our Supreme Court has recognized that an American citizen can be held as an enemy combatant if they collaborate with an enemy, is that the court views that as an act of war, and under the powers of the commander-in-chief, he can suppress all enemies, foreign and domestic, that are at war with us. I do, and let's come back to the, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Constitution. The Constitution makes very clear that a primary responsibility that we have in the federal government is to provide for the common defense, to protect so, the security of the American people. Our courts have recognized that in, during a time of hostilities that the executive branch has the authority to detain an American system, citizen who is helping the enemies of the nation. The question is, does the Congress want to change that for the first time ever? And I would like to add something that my good friend uh, from Rhode Island got me thinking, and I, I've always tried to explain indefinite detention. Uh, what are we trying to do here? Clearly in war there's no requirement to let the enemy prisoner go back to the fight after a passage of time. You don't want to let any enemy prisoner go back to the fight because that makes no good sense. The problem with this war is there will be no definable end and that's the reason we have a habeas review. Because we won't, we'll never know when hostilities are over, so an enemy combatant determination could be a de facto life sentence. And that's why our Supreme Court said we want a judicial check on the executive branch so every enemy combatant will have their day in federal court and the government has to prove by a preponderance of evidence to an independent judge that the, the, the decision to hold this person is warranted under the law. That's what the Hamdi case was about. And I think that makes sense because it will not be the traditional war. It will be a war without a definable end. And the idea of continuing to hold them, if the, go if the judge says to the government, 
you're right. There's compelling evidence that this person was involved with al-Qaeda, tried to uh, get involved with a hostile act. You're right. They're part of the enemy. We can hold them forever, but we've come up with an annual review process to make sure they'll have a chance every year to have their case looked at. And Senator Whitehouse got me thinking. In our own law, under the civil justice system, like the, the Hinckley, the man who shot President Reagan, he was acquitted in court by reason of insanity of shooting President Reagan. He has been in jail since, I mean, in, in a psychiatric hospital ever since because he can be held away from the community because he's a danger to himself or others. So I think what Senator Whitehouse is saying is that the idea that we can hold someone the court has agreed with, the government, as part of the enemy force as a continuing threat is not an unknown concept. You just have to have a review. So I would suggest to our colleagues... Yes. Okay, and I would suggest to our colleagues, let's think this thing through. Let's realize that the, the enemy is coming to our homeland. The enemy is recruiting American citizens. And that if we find an American citizen who has in fact joined forces with Al-Qaeda, our number one goal should be to gather intelligence to prevent future attacks and to find out what that person knows about what the enemy's up to. Our secondary concern should be prosecution. And when you interrogate somebody as an enemy combatant, the best thing you have on your side is time. I don't want to waterboard anyone, but I want to keep them in a controlled environment where time is on our side. And I would argue that the best information we've got from Guantanamo Bay detainees did not come from waterboarding, it came from the fact that we could hold them for an indeterminate period of time, and through time, they began to cooperate and tell us valuable information. Do you agree that's a concept we need to hold on to in this war? Uh, I, I thank my friend. I, I absolutely agree. <clears throat> the, um, and I've, I've talked to professionals uh, in this business of interrogation, and they say that some of the most effective interrogation takes time. Uh, I've had people describe to me uh, um, detainees who were totally uncooperative and uh, they were asked over and over again for days and weeks and months and then finally uh, broke and began to uh, uh, give information that was critically important for the protection of our country. So I want to stress, I do agree, I want to stress two things Senator from South Carolina has said because it's very relevant to the attempt to give special status to Americans deemed to be enemy combatants in contravention of existing United States Supreme Court rulings that say that if you're Amer an American and you're found to have joined the enemy, then you can be treated as an enemy combatant, which common sense tells you is what, what you are. And, and uh, here, here's what I, uh, what I want to say. Um, uh, this, uh, this is really important to what, uh, what we're about here. There are two kinds of due process that are put into this, uh, the bill. The underlying language, the, the compromise that was, has been adopted on the treatment of detainees. One is, um, for the first time, there's a, there's a process, a judicial process, to determine uh, the status of the detainee, whether evidence uh, shows that that detainee in, is in, should in fact be treated as an enemy combatant. The second is that while the enemy combatant is subject to indefinite incarceration, um, that indefinite incarceration is subject to annual review now. So we can determine according to a stated series of standards uh, whether that person should... And, and would you agree that in our domestic criminal law that indefinite ability to question about enemy activity doesn't exist? That, that's absolutely right and you stated Senator uh, Graham earlier and it's an important point and this is the danger we get into when we start to treat 
uh, people who are terrorists as uh, uh, common criminals or even uncommon criminals, which is that the criminal law aims at uh, imp imposing a penalty, doing uh, justice, uh, incarcerating somebody as a result. The, the laws of war are aimed at uh, making sure that enemy combatants, prisoners of war, have taken off the battlefield. And, and to my colleagues, I acknowledge... Well, the war is over. I acknowledge in the Christmas Day bomber case and the Times Square uh, attempted bombing that uh, they were put into federal court. I'm okay with that. I really do believe in all the above approach. Our federal courts can handle cases involving transnational terrorists and al-Qaeda members. So can military commissions. The idea of reading someone their Miranda rights may be the best interrogation technique. I know that we're able to get some good information after reading Miranda rights. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I acknowledge that the people doing the interrogation are better suited to make that decision than I am. I just don't want the Congress by uh, legislation to say for the first time in the history of the country in this war unlike any other war, you no longer have it available to you, the United States government, the ability to hold somebody as enemy combatant if you believe that is the best way to gather intelligence. I'm not saying the other system can't be used. Let's leave it up to the professionals, but the Senate is suggesting through the legislation being proposed that the idea of holding an American citizen who is suspected of collaborating with al-Qaeda, that, that they can no longer be held as an enemy combatant is not only changing the law, it is taking off the table a tool that I think we need now more than ever. And I just don't want us to lose sight of the fact of what we're doing here and what it would mean to our country and our ability to defend us. No one in World War II would have tolerated the idea that someone who collaborated with a Nazi trying to kill us on our own soil would have any other disposition than to be considered an enemy of the American people. Now, my question for this body is, do you think al-Qaeda is an organization that doesn't present that same kind of threat? Is it really the Senate's desire to say during these times that an American citizen can collaborate with al-Qaeda to kill us on our own soil and that's no longer considered an act of war? I would argue that that would be one of the most irresponsible decisions ever made in a time of war by an elected body it not only would change the law as we know it, it would create an opportunity and a hole in our defenses at a time when, as you've indicated, the threat is growing. So to Senator Lieberman, thank you for being a steady, stern, consistent voice along the line that since 9-11, our nation has been in an undeclared state of war the enemy still roams the globe. They have as their hope and dream of hitting us again here at home. And for God's sakes, let's don't weaken our defenses in a way that no other Congress has ever chosen to weaken the executive branch in the past. Thank you for your service. Well, I thank uh, my friend from South Carolina uh, for uh, his expertise in this area and also his uh, sense of principle. We, we've got colleagues on the floor that want to speak. I just want to say um, a final word, because I know the senator from South Carolina is particularly worried about pending amendments that would alter the way in which the underlying bill now uh, treats uh, enemy combatants who are citizens of the United States. Um, the, the underlying bill, uh, the, the underlying provision in the bill on detainee treatment uh, fills a gap in our law that's been harmful and hurtful, uh, difficult for our military to deal with uh, because there is no law about uh, how to treat detainees. 
Um, Senator Graham worked very closely with Senator Levin and Senator McCain to, to draft this compromise. And it's a, it's a good compromise. As he knows, uh, if I had my preference, there'd be no waiver uh, for the, the executive uh, in this, uh, because I believe anybody who's an enemy combatant is an enemy combatant, and as a matter of principle, ought to be uh, held in military custody and tried by a military tribunal according uh, to the, all the protocols of the Geneva Convention, according to the uh, mil uh, military code of justice. Incidentally, if these military tribunals are good enough for American men and women in the military who, who face charges, uh, they're good enough, they ought to be good enough for uh, enemy combatants who face charges. But here's my point. Um, the, the, the Levin, McCain, Graham, uh, provision in, in this bill on detainees is a compromise. It's a, it's a reasonable, effective, bipartisan compromise. It's the kind of compromise that doesn't uh, happen here enough. And um, so I support it because even though I might have wished it would have gone further, so to speak, it, it's, it's a lot better than the status quo. And I, I, I say that at this moment because I really urge our colleagues who now want to come in with other amendments to essentially undo this bipartisan compromise uh, can, can do great damage. I, I'm saying myself, yeah, I wish it had not given uh, the president the power to, to waive that, that he has under the, under the bill and, and take somebody to an, art, a, an enemy combatant to a normal Article III federal court. But uh, it, it's, this, this provision is a real step forward against, uh, from the status quo. And I think if, 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 any, if we can say that, <laughs> we ought to support it. Uh, so I hope that uh, our colleagues will think twice before trying to undo the compromise, and that uh, if they do go forward with it, that our colleagues on the floor will defeat those well, amendments. Well, Mr. President, I, I'll be, wrap this up. I know we've got colleagues who want to speak. Let me just reiterate what Senator Lieberman said. There is a strain of thought that every member of Al-Qaeda, American citizen or not, is an enemy uh, of the people of the United States in a military sense, not a criminal sense, and they should be in a military tribunal. And that's the way we've handled most cases in the past. Here's what I believe. I believe that the choice of venue should lie with the executive branch, and I think there is a very robust role for Article III courts. So I don't want to say, from a congressional point of view, that every member of al-Qaeda has to be tried by military commission all the time, because quite frankly, sometimes Article III courts could be the better venue. When it comes to telling the executive branch that you've got to put a non-citizen in military custody inside the United States, I think that's the right way to do it, but I don't know enough, so if there's a reason to waive that provision, the experts can waive it. So I've been very cautious about micromanaging the executive branch because they're the ones fighting the war. We have a role to play. We have a voice uh, to be heard. And here's what I'm urging my colleagues. This compromise is not what some of our friends wanted, like Senator Lieberman. And quite frankly, it's not what the ACLU wants because they don't buy into the idea that al-Qaeda operatives are anything other than a common criminal. So you got two poles here. I believe an al-Qaeda operative is not a common criminal, and if an American citizen joins al-Qaeda, they should be treated as an enemy combatant as one possibility. But if you want to go down the other road, you can go down that road. I just don't want us to take off the table for the first time in the history of America that an American citizen trying to help the enemy kill us here at home somehow can no longer be talked to by our military to gather intelligence. That's a crazy outcome. So I think we've got a really good bill that gives maximum flexibility to the executive branch but preserves the tools that we're going to need now and in the future. And to my colleagues, please explain, please ask yourself, if in World War II we could hold an American citizen who tried to help the Nazis blow up America as an enemy combatant, why wouldn't you want to help hold an American citizen who's helping al-Qaeda, who did more damage to the homeland than the Nazis, 
as an enemy combatant. Why would you want to take off the table the ability to hold that person, humanely interrogate them to find out why they joined, who they talked to, and what they know? Because what they know and who they talk to may save thousands of lives. And for us to say you can't do that for the first time in the history of the country, I think would be a colossal mistake. So with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Kansas. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, by my fortune, uh, I'm here to speak on, uh, on another topic, but it's been my privilege to hear the discussion between the Senator from North Carolina, South Carolina, Senator Graham, and Senator from Connecticut, Senator Lieberman, as we have what I think is a very a serious debate, discussion about the just position of our constitutional rights as U.S. citizens uh, in light of our desire to make sure that Americans' lives are protected. Uh, I have uh, always struggled with this, uh, trying to find that right balance, and uh, I found uh, tonight's uh, conversation on the Senate floor uh, very valuable to me. I do want to turn my attention and bring to the attention of my colleagues in the Senate uh, a pending piece of legislation, a, a, a bill that I've introduced uh, dealing with our, our country's economy, and particularly as it relates to financial institutions uh, and, again, particularly our community banks. There are, as we know, so many Americans that are looking for work. Uh, our government's first priority, I would say, is to defend our country, and we've been having that debate, how we do that. But we also have a significant responsibility to create an environment where businesses can grow and put people to work. Uh, and I want to point out tonight uh, a piece of legislation that I've introduced that I believe is part of that solution. Uh, it's called the Community's First Act, and it's a compilation of just what I would say is common sense tax and regulatory relief ideas for our nation's smallest financial institutions. We hear constantly about Wall Street. I want to worry tonight about Main Street. These banks in communities across Kansas and in states across our country were not the cause of the financial crisis from which we are still struggling to emerge. But unfortunately, they have become the victims. They've become casualties of that crisis on Wall Street. Hundreds of community banks have been allowed to fail, and the survivors are left waiting for the next burdensome regulation to come from Washington, D.C. Until banks are willing and able to make prudent loans to creditworthy hometown customers, job creation will remain stifled and our economic recovery will continue to lag. The evidence seems clear to me that the current regulatory requirements impose a disproportionate burden on community banks because they do not operate on the scale to spread the legal and compliance costs. When a bank with just, say, 40 employees requires four compliance experts, I believe something is terribly wrong. This expense of over-regulation diminishes the ability of a community bank to attract capital and to support the credit needs of customers. What that means is that an investment in a bank, that, that someone who wants to be a stockholder, uh, the owner of a community bank, because of the cost of capital, the regulatory, regulatory costs increase the cost of capital, and because of that, they will decide there's a different way to earn a living, a, a different place to invest that capital. So in short, these burdens prevent a community bank from serving their community, and they avoid, therefore, the resulting job creation that comes when a community bank invests at home. All of the regulations being piled on community banks might be justified if the failure of a community bank could pose a serious risk to our nation's financial system, but that's clearly, clearly not the case. It was not the failure of several hundred community banks that left our economy in such poor condition. It was the financial condition of a handful of, large, of our largest firms in America that grew so large and so complex that their failure or bankruptcy could not be tolerated and the consequences would affect every American. We need a tailored approach to regulation. Ross Wilson, one of my constituents in La Crosse, Kansas, a banker, wrote this to me. He says his, his bank will no longer make home loans, real estate loans. 
And this is his quote, as a community banker, I really hate this decision, but the complexity of the new regulations have, have forced us to make this decision. It appears that the powers that be in Washington don't understand the importance of a small community bank. When your hometown bank won't make a home loan to one of its customers, not because the loan won't be repaid, but because the regulatory costs are far too significant, our regulations have far exceeded their value. So how does the community's first act that I'm introduced change this trend and restore some level of sanity to our financial regulations? This legislation would strip away outdated and unnecessary regulations like Graham Leach Bliley's annual privacy notice requirement. Under current law, every bank and credit union is required to disclose their privacy policies on an annual basis, even if, that's bank, even if that bank's policy has never changed during the year. So you can have a customer of the bank that's been a customer forever, they have a policy in place that never changes, but every year the bank has to send out a significant mailing to every customer explaining their policy in regard to privacy. While that burden maybe doesn't sound too significant, it's a costly requirement of questionable benefit. Blake Hyde, who is of the first options bank in, uh, the first option bank in Paola, Kansas, told me that, and here's his quote, uh, very little of what the regulations have to do is productive or helps us take care of our customers better. Just the privacy notices alone cost our small bank in excess of $13,000 annually. We haven't changed it. We never sold our customer information, and we still don't. The, first communities, uh, the, the community's first act would also address an issue regarding SEC registration by community banks. The number of shareholders which triggers a registration has not been updated in a long time and remains a burden that discourages community bankers from raising capital and making loans. The Community's First Act would also reform which banks are required to comply with the costly, costly burdens of Sarbanes-Oxley. Current law exempts banks with market capitalization of $75 million from compliance under Section 404. The benefits of that section do not appear to be worth the cost so my legislation raises that threshold. Another common sense provision would encourage Americans to save by reducing the tax on longer term certificates of deposit. It would also allow for individuals under the age of 26 to invest in Roth IRAs without regard to their income level. We desperately need Americans to save money for their long term retirement benefits. The Community First Act would also reform the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau so that the National Credit Union Administration, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and the other uh, regulators would have a meaningful role in the creation of consumer protection rules. Dodd-Frank provides these regulators insufficient input and review of the CFPB, and the results of poorly written regulations could mean less credit and, again, fewer jobs. There seems to be some disagreement here in Washington, D.C. today about the effects of burdensome regulations on our economic recovery. But back in Kansas, Jay Kennedy of the First National Bank of Frankfurt indicates that, quote, of our, our staff of seven and a half people are busy taking care of our customers and serving our communities. The extra burden from things like tracking escrow payments, sending privacy notices, and filing call reports that take a month to complete all create undue stress and busy work for us. Kansans know what that word busy work, what those words busy work means. The relief of those three things alone would allow us time to teach financial literacy that our schools can no longer afford to do and create new products to better serve our customers. The provisions of the Communities First Act are just a first step in unleashing the ability of small banks to do what they do best, provide capital that results in jobs. Congress has created a regulatory monster, and I would urge my colleagues to join me in removing unnecessary burdens from our financial system and co-sponsor Senate Bill 1600, the Community's First Act. While this legislation may direct benefits at our nation's community banks and financial institutions, our small financial institutions, the real beneficiaries are the entrepreneurs, the Main Street small businessmen and women, and farmers and ranchers who, with access to credit, can help put Americans back to work.
Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, just a parliamentary inquiry. Are we in morning business? We are. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I've come to the floor this evening to congratulate the President of the International, Associ uh, International Association of Machinists Union, Tom Buffenbarger, and Boeing, uh, Boeing's CEO, Jim McNerney, on their agreement today to extend their current contract for four years. Mr. President, this is a good deal. It reflects a strong and commendable commitment by Boeing to continue having their top quality products made by top quality workers. It provides real job security and fair treatment for the company's valued employees. It will also resolve the current labor dispute between the company and the union that is pending before the National Labor Relations Board. This settlement is a step forward for a great company, Boeing, a step forward for a great union, the machinist union, and a step forward for our great nation. Again, I commend the CEO of Boeing, Mr. Jim McNerney, the president of the machinist union, Tom Buffenbarger, for working out this agreement. Mr. President, this agreement is also a compelling demonstration of the fact that the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board process, works, works for all concerned. When an alleged unlawful activity happens, a charge is filed with the NLRB. That's what's supposed to happen. And while the NLRB's process was playing out, the parties were able to sit down, negotiate, and strike a deal, which they announced today. As a matter of fact, that's what happens to most unfair labor practice charges filed at the NLRB. It's all a part of the process at that independent agency. Just like in our court system, cases settle to the benefit of both parties. That's what happened here. And it also settled to the benefit of our nation. What should not have happened was the unprecedented level of political and congressional interference in this case. It wasn't just that Republican elected officials attempted to try this case in the press. They went far beyond this. House Republicans attempted to eliminate the board's funding entirely because of this case. Senate Republicans have blocked nominees for the board and the general counsel of the NLRB. House Republicans tried to subpoena the prosecutor's case file so they could obtain documents that the company had been unable to obtain in the litigation. A member of this body, of this body, called the acting NLRB general counsel, Mr. Leif Solomon, an independent prosecutor, a 30-year career veteran of the agency, not a political appointee, a member of this body called him and threatened to come after Mr. Solomon, quote, guns a-blazing, end quote, if he brought charges against Boeing. I'm informed that the House Oversight Committee actually threatened to try to revoke the bar licenses, the bar licenses of individual career attorneys at the National Labor Relations Board. Because of this case, I have never in all my years in public office seen such brazen and inappropriate interference with the business of an independent agency, and I hope to never see it again. The time and attention that House Republicans have devoted to their attack campaign against the National Labor Relations Board is nothing short of astonishing. What's even more absurd and shameless is the fact that they claim that this attack campaign was intended to save jobs. What saved jobs was the negotiations between the great company Boeing and the great union, the machinist union. That's what saved the jobs. I'm mystified by the suggestion by some Republicans that gutting the NLRB would somehow revive our economy. In survey after survey, business leaders agree about what's hurting the economy. It's not government. It's not regulation. It's not the NLRB. It's the lack of consumer demand. 
Workers don't have enough money to buy things, and the economy won't pick up until they do. Weakening workers' rights, taking away their ability to speak up for fair treatment, will only make the problem worse. Attacking American workers and the agency that protects them is a poor substitute for a real job creation strategy. Americans know that the National Labor Relations Board is not remotely responsible for our country's economic woes. Incapacitating this agency will not put food on people's tables, help them keep their homes, find jobs, or send their kids to college. It will, however, send a strong message to those few, few, unscrupulous employers who want to take advantage of this bad economy to mistreat hardworking people. Fortunately, that is not the case with Boeing. Without the NLRB, there would be no watchdog, and it would be open season on workers' rights. At a time when decent jobs with good wages and fair treatment are getting harder and harder to find, this would be a step in the wrong direction for our country. Mr. President, the National Labor Relations Board is an independent federal agency charged with an important mission. In fulfilling that mission, the dedicated professionals at the board are doing their jobs as the law intended. Now it's time for the Republicans in the House and the Senate to do the same. Instead of continuing to pursue this pointless and distracting partisan crusade to dismantle and do away with the National Labor Relations Board, it's time to put this episode behind us. It's time to recognize the NLRB is doing its job, that companies and unions will sit down and work things out and settle things out without the Senate and the House and governors and governors of other states trying to interfere and make it a political football. Mr. President, again, I congratulate the Boeing Company and the International Association of Machinists in doing what's best for America. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Nevada. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the opportunity to spend a few minutes here on the Senate floor. I want to thank my, the previous uh, speaker, uh, uh, Senator Moran from Kansas, and his timely comments, uh, specifically regarding uh, housing, uh, the ability for uh, small institutions, community banks, to uh, be able to produce the capital they need uh, to help these small businesses and these, and these homeowners, but specifically the ability to create jobs. Um, and it dovetails into what I want to talk about today, and that's solutions, solutions for the American people. This week, uh, Congress has an opportunity to come together to help hardworking Americans and those taxpayers and extend the payroll tax cut holiday. No state needs Congress to put aside political bickering more than the great state of Nevada. Right now, as a percentage, more Nevadans are looking for jobs than in any other state. Right now, more Nevadans are having difficulty holding on to their homes than in any other state. And right now, more Nevadans are filing for bankruptcies than in any other state. There was a report that was released yesterday named Nevada the toughest place in the country to find a job. Our number one priority in this Congress should be to turn this economy around and get, get people working again. And yet here I am standing on the United States Senate floor today trying to convince the majority not to raise taxes on small businesses. I'm proud of my state. I'm confident that with the right policies in place, Nevadans can find job opportunities and overcome these difficult times. But in order for that to happen, Congress must put partisanship aside, come together to pass meaningful legislation that benefits Americans who need help in this tough economy and expand opportunities for employers looking to hire. Extending the payroll tax cut will allow Americans to hold on to wages they worked hard to earn. Under my plan, hardworking American taxpayers will not see a tax increase. Under my plan, we will prevent a tax increase on those already receiving the payroll tax credit. And under my plan, employers can continue to invest in their businesses so they can grow 
expand, and hire more workers without the fear of a tax increase. Americans need jobs desperately. Congress should be focused on policies that create jobs and drive long-term economic growth. The legislation I have proposed allows Congress to responsibly extend the payroll tax cut and treat taxpayers' dollars appropriately. There's no question Congress should extend the payroll tax cut. Republicans, Democrats, Independents, everyone agrees on that. But we shouldn't do it by turning around and raising taxes on employers everywhere. Nevadans are looking for jobs. Increasing taxes on small businesses in Nevada is bad economic policy, and taking away the capital that they could use to invest makes little sense. Rather than finding a solution for hardworking Americans, the majority has chosen to go down a path that is engineered purposely to fail. They know that there's little chance that a tax increase on the American hardworking taxpayers and their businesses will pass the Senate. And they know that there's no chance their tax increase will pass in the House. So instead of success and reaching bipartisan agreement, the majority has chosen to focus on failure and scoring political points. Honestly, these are the games that the American people are tired of. My way or the highway mentality. Proposals that have no chance for success, bickering at the expense of our economy. We have a, divide, a divided Congress. That means that to ensure 160 million, million Americans receive an extension of this tax cut, we need to move beyond petty politics of this majority. As a senator from the state that's leading the nation in unemployment, I'm particularly disturbed by this determination to play the political game rather than focus on solutions that work for all Americans. With a little common sense, we can pay for the payroll tax cut without raising taxes on job creators. We can reduce government spending where it's no longer needed and require the richest Americans to pay higher premium, premiums for Medicare. This will allow us to strengthen and preserve Medicare for those, who, uh, those Americans who rely on the program the most. And since my colleagues on the other side of the aisle frequently talk about how the richest Americans should be doing more, I believe this is an approach that both Democrats and Republicans can support. By voting for this alternative plan, Congress can put political gamesmanship aside and support a workable solution for all Americans. The bipartisan veterans job bill along with the 3% withholding bill that Congress passed earlier this month is proof that when Congress has the will to work together, they can find a pathway forward. My proposal provides Congress with another opportunity to break the political gridlock here in Washington, D.C. and vote for a solution that can pass Congress and be signed into law. I'm hopeful that Congress can work together to extend the payroll tax cut, preserve opportunities for job growth. It's past time that Congress put aside politics and focus on policies that work for Nevadans and all Americans already struggling in this difficult economic environment. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back the floor. Mr. President, the Senator from Minnesota. Mr. President, I rise today to speak in regard to the National Defense Authorization Act and in particular to certain sections of the bill which target a serious but often underaddressed problem facing the men and women of our armed services. This is sexual assault. I introduced this legislation on this issue in the spring with Senator Susan Collins and I remain deeply concerned about the subject. Many of our colleagues are aware that sexual assault is a persistent problem within our armed forces. In fact, reports of trauma have risen in recent years. In March, the Department of Defense put out its annual report on sexual assault in the military. According to the estimates, there were more than 3,000 reports of sexual assault in the military last year. That includes reports by both male and female victims exposing attacks perpetrated both by and against members of our military. 
and those are just the reported attacks. Since the Department of Defense estimates that only 13% of victims actually come forward, we can assume the real number of sexual assaults is much higher, upwards of 19,000. The Department of Veterans Affairs has reported similarly disturbing figures. More than 20% of female service members seen at VA medical facilities say they were sexually assaulted or harassed during their service. Now let me make this clear. We know that the vast majority of men and women serving in our military would never be involved in sexual assault. They have the toughest jobs out there. They're on the front line every day. But when we have a problem, we can't just put our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening. In 2008 alone, VA medical personnel reported nearly half a million encounters with veterans that focused on sexual assault and harassment. Our service members are already dealing with the stress of battle, they're fighting two wars, and they're responding to other conflicts and needs around the globe. The idea that an American in uniform who is out there on the front lines serving our country may also suffer the physical and emotional trauma of sexual assault is simply unacceptable. And it is also unacceptable, Mr. President, that the records of that assault would be destroyed. According to the VA, women who experience sexual assault or sexual harassment in the military have a 59% higher risk of developing mental health injuries. Sexual trauma doesn't just hurt the victims either. It can also take a huge toll on the soldiers who serve by their sides. It has been shown to severely undermine military cohesion, team morale, and overall force effectiveness. The Department of Defense is well aware of this problem, and over the years, it has taken some positive steps to address it. For example, the Pentagon has created positions for personnel specially trained to handle reports of sexual trauma. It has improved counseling services for victims, and it has implemented new training procedures for commanders. But despite these important improvements, the Defense Department continues to fall short in one very key area ensuring the lifelong preservation of victims' records from reports of sexual assault. As a former prosecutor, I know firsthand how important it is to preserve the data connected to crimes like sexual assault. That's why I'm so troubled by the gaps we've seen at the Defense Department. As of now, there is no coordinated cross-service policy for ensuring the preservation of medical records and other information resorted that is related to sexual assault. In this day and age, it seems a little crazy. Some of the branches have five years. Some of them have 10 years. There is no policy, and many of these records are destroyed. These are records, Mr. President, of sexual assault. Across the board, these policies, or lack thereof, are bleak. In a significant number of cases of sexual assault, the data is destroyed within one year. It is simply shredded. The problems this can cause for service members are extensive. Within one year, the service member loses the proof that he or she experienced a sexual assault connected to military service. And as a prosecutor, if you have someone who was maybe accused of a crime or maybe no one followed through on it, and then later they go on and they commit an actual crime and there's a trial, you want to be able to access the records from the past. Also, for the individual victim, it means that they no longer have access to the evidence necessary for pursuing criminal action against their perpetrator. It also means that if the victim experiences depression or any other ailment, either mental or physical, relating to the assault, they may not be able to prove that it was caused during their service, meaning they will not be able to seek VA disability benefits. There are far too many examples of this out there of service members being denied compensation from the VA for disabilities caused by sexual military assault. There are far too many examples of service members who've been told to, quote, find a witness, end quote, and when there are no witnesses, they have been told to, quote, get their attackers to assess, attest to the assault, end quote. This is not the way that we should be treating our service members. This year, my office was contacted by a group of Minnesota women veterans, veterans of all ages, who have bonded together to share their stories of sexual assault and to advocate for stronger protections from the Department of Defense and the VA. These women signed up to serve, they performed well and honorably, and if in the course of their service they experienced an assault, an assault that would not have been experienced if they had not volunteered, then we owe them the basic decency of keeping their records. That is all we're talking about here. 
We have appreciated that the Department of Defense is open to it, that the leaders of this bill are working with us on this issue. This bill was originally introduced with Senator Collins, Senator Murkowski, and Senator McCaskill. We were able to get 23 co-sponsors on this bill, including every single woman in the United States Senate. The Support for Survivors Act also is endorsed by several key veteran service organizations, including the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Disabled American Veterans, and the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, as well as the Service Women's Action Network. The Support for Survivors Act is straightforward. Quite simply, it requires the Department of Defense to ensure lifelong storage of all documents connected with reports of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the military, while also maintaining full privacy for those involved. Likewise, the purpose and motivation of this legislation is also pretty simple. It's about supporting our veterans. I've always believed that when we ask men and women to sacrifice for us in defense of our nation, we make them a promise that we're going to give them the support when they come home. As Abraham Lincoln has said, we need to care for those who have borne the battle. While protecting our service members' personal records, protecting their rights is just about that. This week, senators are considering a critically important bill, the National Defense Authorization Act. And I'm happy to say that this year, the defense authorization already includes the significant majority of the provisions of my support for Survivors Act. This summit, summer, the Senate Armed Services Committee saw fit to address the issue of military sexual assault during its markup of the bill. And I'm grateful for the time and effort my colleagues have invested in reviewing this issue. Already, the National Defense Authorization Act requires the Department of Defense to collaborate with the Department of Veterans Affairs in developing a comprehensive policy for ensuring retention and access to sexual assault records. Importantly, the bill ensures protection of the privacy of the records. It also calls on the Defense Department and the VA to address access to the records, not only for victims, but also for the VA, law enforcement, and other entities that may need to access them. And the bill seeks to make the policy uniform across all service branches so that members of the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines are given the fair treatment. Why, Mr. President, would you have records destroyed of sexual assault in one branch after a year, in another branch after five years, and another after ten years? It's my position they shouldn't be destroyed at all. The one provision which was not included in the defense authorization and which I feel is vitally important was a requirement that records be stored throughout the life of the victim. Storing records for a person's lifetime is in my mind common sense. All our other critical records, such as our health records, insurance records, banking records, are stored throughout our lives. So I believe the case should be the same here. Unfortunately, the Defense Authorization Act does not require lifelong storage. Instead, it puts this question entirely in the hands of the Defense Department, requiring only that the records be stored for five years and otherwise allowing the agency to determine its own timing. Five years is not enough, Mr. President. Yes, it's five times the length of the time the records are currently stored, and in that respect it is a good step, but it is not enough. Not in a modern day where we store records and we have ways of storing records in a way, and certainly the Defense Department knows how to store these records in a way that is private. That's why I've filed an amendment that would ensure that almost all sexual assault records are stored for an estimated 50 years. This solution is one that I've discussed personally with Senator Levin. It's also something my office has worked on closely with the Department of Defense. And though 50 years is not necessarily the life of the victim, it gets us a long way and is certainly better than what we have now. I want to thank Chairman Levin for his willingness to work with me on this important issue and for his efforts to include this amendment in the overall bill. I also want to thank the Republicans, the other side of the aisle, uh, for working with us on this and the fact that this was a bipartisan amendment from the beginning, again, including the sponsorship, the underlying bill included the sponsorship of all women senators in the United States Senate. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment as well as the strong provisions in this bill that address sexual assault protection for military members. The problems of sexual trauma within the military is broad, but the provisions included in the bill, including my amendment, are important advancements. 
I intend to monitor the Defense Department's implementation of these provisions, and although I was not able to secure the full lifelong record preservation, I'm going to keep fighting this fight. But 50 years for most of the records is a pretty good result, given what we have in place right now. This year, the Department of Defense has finally placed a military officer in charge of its Sexual Assault Protection and Responsive Office, General Mary Kay Hertog. I believe she has not only a good grasp on the importance of preserving records, but also has the rank and weight necessary to forge real change in the department's policies. I intend to continue my communication with General Hertog, and I look forward to finding a policy that ensures that victims have lifelong access to their personal records. When our men and women signed up to serve, there wasn't a line, and there shouldn't be a line when they get back not for the jobs, not for education, and not to receive the medical benefits or help or protection that they've earned. I see my colleagues, uh, leaders on this bill, uh, Senator Levin and Senator McCain are here, and I again thank them for working with me on this amendment. Mr. President, I yield the floor.